Hello, Washoe County Library System welcomes you to our monthly series, the Nevada Historical Society presents High Noon with Neil Cobb. This fascinating program will share a little known story of how the Reno Sparks area contributed to the space race and the moon landing. It will also showcase official Rocketdyne photographs. My name is Terry and I'm so happy to be hosting for you today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Sherry Hayes Zorn. Thank you, Terry, and welcome everybody for joining us today. And as always, thank you to the Washoe County Library System for helping us host these virtual events and getting these great stories um, of different Nevada topics, people, places, and things. Uh, we love being able to share Nevada history with all of you. So um, as Terry mentioned, I'm Sherry with the Nevada Historical Society. I'm the curator of history, and I love hosting this event and getting to introduce our host, Neil. Cobb. Neil is such a great supporter of the Nevada Historic Society. He's even an honorary curator, and he's been supporting us since 1988, helping spread great Nevada history and helping share um, the information about the Historic Society and what we do to help preserve Nevada's heritage. So without further ado, let me introduce our host, Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi, Sherry, and thank you. Our speaker today, Dick Dryling, has been a Truckee Meadows resident since 1947, with a slight exception there, 30 years in the U.S. Navy, and we thank him for that. A 1956 graduate of Reno High, he is a U.S. postage stamp collector since 1948, and U.S. first day cover collector since 1950, postcard collector collector of Reno, Sparks, Carson City, and Virginia City, member of the Nevada Stamp Study Society since 1975, the only stamp club in Nevada, north of Las Vegas. On Thursday, October 15th, 2022, the Governor's Points of Light awards recognition and they recognize the Sparks Museum former board president and current secretary, Dick Dryling, with the Governor's Points of Light Silver Award in the category of Lifetime Achievement. The Lifetime Achievement Award recognizes any individual who has demonstrated extraordinary achievement in volunteerism and service in Nevada for the good for a period of 20 years or more. Dick has volunteered at the Sparks Heritage Museum since 1999, serving as a tour guide, holding down the front desk, a volunteer greeter, the president, and primary author of the museum's quarterly publication, The Headlight. This exemplifies the mission of Sparks and Heritage Museum, which is to collect and preserve the history and culture of the city of Sparks. We congratulate, congratulate Dick Dryling on his award recognition and thank him dearly for his many years of volunteer service. At this time, please welcome our speaker today, Mr. Dick Dryling. Thank you, Neil. I thought I'd give a couple of words of why I put this exhibit together. I was working on the front desk. A gentleman walked in one day and said, I'm getting ready to write a book. What do you have on the rocket dying test site? I had never heard of such a thing. But I went in the back, went through everything. I came out. I said, we have nothing. He left. I said, that can't be. So I started doing some research and finally discovered that in fact, there was a rock test site north of here. And I went to a newspaper and talked, said we're doing an article about it. Anyone who worked there, please get in touch with him. Well, I got several people gave me some uh, information. And then I found out that I had to go to Idaho to visit one of the old uh, managers and uh, 
he is the one who came out with all these photographs that we have now. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. From 1962 to 1970, Rocket 9, then a division of North American Aviation, operated a rocket engine testing facility located about 20 miles north of, of the Arena Sparks area. Here, all of the white on this map it belonged to Rocket Dine. It's 120, over 126,000 acres. Of that total acreage, only about 1% or approximately 1,600 acres was actually used for the testing. Uh, uh, three of them were for rocket engine testing. Uh, site A was uh, their airport, which is an old uh, World War II uh, airport. And then site B, C, and D were actual uh, test sites. And uh, E is their administration building. Uh, area B was located at the top of Axano Canyon Road. Area C was located on Right Hand Canyon Road. And area D was located at the end of Whistling Springs Road. Engines for the Gemini Lunar Module, Apollo, and Space Shuttle programs were all tested at these three sites. This is Gemini engine test capsule located between the control center and the effluent pond in this diagram. It's about dead center in the picture there. The capsule, approximately 15 feet in diameter, 30 feet long, was designed to test the Gemini positional thruster in the engines at space conditions, approximately 200,000 feet. The vacuum was used by using a three stage steam injector system powered by two uh, fuel-oiled steam boilers. The flight engines were tested, cleaned, inspected, packaged in a level four clean room located next to the control center. The engines tested were 25 pound, 83 pound, and 100 pound thrust, designed to, to fire in very short uh, duration pulses. This allowed the Gemini Space Castle to be accurately positioned and controlled uh, construction was underway in the back for a two position lunar, uh, excuse me, engine test site. And that test site consisted of a lunar excursion test system. Pipe sections were uh, 10 feet in diameter. A wide connection was designed with 10 foot butterfly valves used to set up one of the two test positions for the test. Each position consisted of a test capsule. That housed the engine with necessary controls, instrumentation, and fire extinguishing systems. To the left of the Y is the pressure fed propellant Atlas S4 rocket engine combustion chamber where water was injected at very high pressure and temperature uh, stream was powered to two steam injectors for creating a vacuum in the test uh, capsule. The overall length of the system about 300 feet. Okay, this is representative of the positional thrusters on the Apollo spacecraft. What they're used for is to uh, position their the craft and, and move around. They were between uh, 24 and 36 on each spacecraft. Here's an initial test of the uh, steam powered hydro test system. When tested, one could hear the the power of the horn like sound many, many miles away. This is the Airbnb control room. The gentleman holding the phone that is here is Jim Gardner, a 1956 Reno High School graduate. This is the descent uh, engine as used in the Apollo lunar module to land on the, uh, on the moon. The engine could be throttled between 1,000 and 10,000 pounds of thrust. It was also gimbaled, and uh, it was the first gimbaled and throttable engine used in a spacecraft. The engine was built by the Space Technology Laboratories, but they could never get it to work properly, so they turned it over and rocket drive perfected it. This is the liquid propellant uh, lunar module ascent engine. 
one of the most important of the men of Apollo missions, since it was used to lift the ascent stage from the surface of the moon and then dock with the command module orbiting the moon. The original contractor was Bell Aerospace. However, they could not make it work properly, so Rocket 9 perfected the engine. All the flight engines were test fired at NFL, the field laboratory, cleaned, inspected, and shipped off to the installation of the, on the spacecraft. It produced 3,500 pounds of thrust. Now, what's interesting about this is that every astronaut that landed on the moon and came back safely was strictly because the engines were tested right here in our own backyard. I think that's cool. This is the closest you can get to the site today. On February 19th, 2014, the Reno Gazette Journal received permission to visit the site and a photograph of two remaining segments of the equipment are remaining on site. And what you see here is, is the two, two of the segments, uh, and yet they're uh, 30 feet long and 10 feet in diameter. I don't know why they were abandoned, but that's, that's the way it is. Okay. This is a view of the site from Google Earth at that time. And as you can see, there are the two uh, elements uh, in on the site. When NFL first opened in 1962, Area C was primarily used by rocket kind research for rocket engine solid propellant research and development. This ended in 1967. The air was cleaned up in preparation for Navy missile program program called Condor. Construction began late 1967, was completed early 1968. The city consisted of two test positions to test the missile power package at ambient and environmental hot and cold conditions. It contained a 15,000 gallon liquid nitrogen tank for operational cold traps that were used in the vacuum system for cleanup of all systems of contamination prior to loading the power package, propellants, and removal of residual propellants from the system after the test. There was a pit system for accumulation, treatment, and disposal of unused propellants. The A test position was shown with the Condor power package installed and ready for test. The Condor was powered by two 1,500 pound rocket uh, engines using chloro, uh, chlorine hydrochloride and hydrazine as propellants. These hypergallic uh, propellants would start burning on con contact with each other. The Vikings had internal collapsible tanks when pressurized externally, which forced the propellants into the engines. This shows a successful test of the Condor power package. The longest test was 454 uh, seconds in length at full crest. There were two major failures of test hardware during the testing process, resulting in the loss of hardware and amount of damage to test positions. <clears throat> because of realized risk and danger in handling a power package on a flight deck of aircraft carriers, where the average age of the sailors between 24 and, and uh, 30, and many as young as 18, the program was canceled in 1969. This is what was left on the site when I uh, went out to uh, the site in, in 2008. The sign on the door says Area C Ground Remediation System, authorized personnel only. And here's a Google Earth view in 2014. As indicated, this is the view of the high pressure test facility. Some of the most spectacular tests with much larger thrust engines were conducted on this site. This is a 30,000 pound thrust engine test for 100 seconds, which was taken from a distance of about one and a half miles. The test was completed about four months after completion of construction and activation of the OED complex. The BLM Firewatch saw what they thought was a range fire and sent out a firefighting crew. Rocket 9 security stopped them, explained there was a test. They weren't too happy about that. Rocketdyne agreed to notify them of all planned testing in the future. 
The Area D test position with a 30,000 pound truss engine installed, you can't really see it well, but it's a chuckle net mechanism. The pressure and propellant systems with the uh, propellant tanks are to the right. This facility gives a 90 degree water cooled flame deflector to divert the flame to the horizontal. This was included at some scale for the 30,000 pound truss engine test nozzle hardware. The photo was submitted by Alan Chambers, who is the area supervisor. He's the man in the suit. He's also the man in Idaho that I went up and talked to, and he's the one providing me with all the photos. 45 years later, he said he didn't remember the names of all the crew. This shows a new test site, Delta II, under construction. The engine installed in the capsule was designed to test at ambient and space vacuum conditions. When tested at space conditions, the blue diffuser was installed. The vacuum was seized by the engine thrust passing through a nozzle in the diffuser section, which pulled a vacuum in the capsule. This shows a 40,000 pound thrust aerospike uh, rocket engine installed and ready for test. The aerospike was an advanced concept in engine design. The standard engine nozzle is configured to operate efficiently at altitude desired, such as launch, high altitude, or space. They're not operating uh, efficiently throughout the flight from sea level to uh, pressure to deep space. The aerospike has no actual nozzle. The concept was the Toyota, the safe with a combustion chamber, uh, creates an exhaust gas to form its own port nozzle shape depending on the atmosphere pressure. The thrust push is applied on the flat plate in the center of the engine, shown. The balance where gas is hydrogen and liquid oxygen. High pressure water is used to cool the combustion zone in the engine. This shows a successful test of a 40,000 pound truss aerospike engine. Water coolant was sprayed on the left concrete wall and, and plowed under the exhaust to prevent damage to the concrete. Note the white light on the left side of the engine. What you're seeing is the burning of the uh, hydrogen and oxygen in Toyota combustion chamber at the temperature of about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> the combustion chamber is circular and shaped somewhat like a donut. This picture was taken at the moment of test hardware failure during a test of a 20,000 pound rocket engine. This is why all personnel were located in a two foot thick walled concrete control center about 300 feet away, and all access to the test site was closed during the test. Not unusual to have some rocket engine damage because of failure of the testing. This shows a test of the 40,000 pound truss aerospike rocket engine. This shows a test of the 40,000 pound truss aerospike engine with a diffuser nozzle attached. The end exhaust through the diffuser created a near vacuum condition inside the, the capsule. This provides engine performance data for space operation. This shows a night test of the 40,000 pound aerospike rocket engine. This shows a liquid hydrogen blowdown of a 250,000 pound thrust aerospike rocket engine. Now, 250,000 pounds of thrust is the thrust for a main rocket engine. That it, there's four or five on each of the manned space craft. The blowdown is conducted to calibrate the flow rates of pressure drop throughout the system. The same type of blowdown was conducted on the fuel side with liquid hydrogen. The blowdowns were necessary to be able to accurately control engine thrust, propellant flows, and pressure during the test, so engine design or operating conditions could be met and reduce the risk of hardware damage. This is the largest engine tested in Area D. The total propellant flow on this engine is about 350 gallons per second. That's a lot of flow. Unfortunately, NASA decided they would never accept that, that engine. 
So all the power uh, flights had a, a standard uh, engine with a nozzle so forth. This October 1967 shows a test area after modification to both the Delta I and Delta II test stands and the test area. Test stand Delta I was modified to test rocket engines with high pressure oxygen and nitrogen. Engines D1 were tested vertically. The D2 was modified to test the 30,000 pound Bolko engine. The Bolko is spelled B O E L K O W. German company. The test area modification consists of installing a second 20,000 gallon liquid hot nitrogen storage tank. This is a position of portion of the uh, support equipment for area D. This shows a 30,000 psi uh, gaseous nitrogen storage bottle in the foreground, 350 cubic foot hydrogen storage tank to rear left and 10,000 PSI gases hydrogen compressor to the right. This shows the 30,000 gallon liquid hydrogen and oxygen storage tanks to the right and some 10,000 pound PSI gases hydrogen and nitrogen storage bottles on the left. This is south side of position Delta II. It shows a liquid hydrogen run tank located behind a blast wall for separation from the rocket engine and a test capsule. The liquid oxygen side is similar. This shows the east side of position Delta II. It shows the back side of the position. The liquid hydrogen tank on the left and liquid oxygen tank is on the right. This is the north side of position Delta II. Shows high pressure storage bottle to the run tanks in more detail. Now, if you look on there, uh, about uh, on the platform, you see uh, one man standing there. Gives you some scale of the size of the place. Here is testing the 30,000 pound Volco truss uh, rocket engine, began in 1967. Shows a successful test of the engine using propellants liquid hydrogen and uh, liquid oxygen. The Bolko program was a combined effort between Rocketdyne and a German company called Bolko. Bolko designed and fabricated the thrust chamber assembly, and Rocketdyne designed the uh, and provided the development engineering responsibility for setting the test requirements. It was first engine tested in Rocketdyne that was designed and tested for. Uh, chamber pressure as high as 3,000 psi. The test was conducted with a chamber pressure of 4,000 psi and resulted in about 40,000 pounds of thrust. And rocket engines resulted in increasing chamber pressure, results in higher performance, or as a comparison, more miles to the gallon. Longest test performed during this was 167 seconds, which is a maximum for Fueling for engine test grounds due to run tank capacity. Note the white light at the end of engine nozzle. That's the color of running oxygen and hydrogen at temperature about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This shows a bulk of the engine installed and ready to test. The all, overall engine length is about two feet in diameter uh, and a diameter of 10 inches. It's really small for producing. 30 to 40,000 pounds of thrust. Note the control center way in the background uh, to the right of the picture. This shows a close up of the Bolko engine test. Notice the white light inside the nozzle. The orange coloration on the outer edge indicates some uh, inside or outside contamination being burned off. So the, the color of Oxygen and nitrogen burning is, is white. The orange is, is garbage. Now this shows the second generation of the 250,000 pound air thrust aerospike rocket engine installed and ready to test. The propellants again was uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The first version was damaged during a test and could no longer be used. This view is from the side showing the uh, center cone that was cooled with cold 
gases, hydrogen to limit damage from the black burn, 6,000 degree Fahrenheit to exhaust flame. You can see the engine throat at the exit of the combustion chamber at the base. The throat and combustion chamber seem shaped somewhat like a donut. There's no external nozzle on the air flight engine. Now, this is a sex level test of a 250,000 pound thrust aerospike with a diffuser nozzle installed that provided a vacuum in the engine capsule to simulate testing its face conditions. Now, what they're simulating is 200,000 feet altitude. And the thrust uh, going through the diffuser creates a vacuum. This shows a successful test of 250,000 pound. Uh, thrust without diffuser attached. The center cone shows two distinct colors uh, areas of cooling. The section nearest the throat and combustion chamber is cooled internally with gaseous hydrogen. The outer section is uh, externally cooled with gaseous hydrogen. The outer section obviously gets much hotter. This is as close as you can get, well, in 2009. I, I haven't been out there since then. All property in this area privately owned. This is a 1980 Google Earth view. And you can see there are a lot of structures left on the Area D site. I have no idea what's out there today. This is a main administration building, also a laboratory for their service groups. And this is what it looked at when I took the picture in 2009. At that time, the building was up for sale. It's located just off Greenwood Highway at Whiskey Springs Road. In 1967, a decision was made to operate a cattle ranch on part of the owned property that was not being used for hot uh, for rocket engine testing. The cattle ranch was moder moderately successful. The animal soon became used to noise, the engine testing, and didn't cause any problems. By 1970, NASA decided no longer buy rocket engines, not develop and tested at NASA sites. So this decision was finally made to shut down the Nevada Field Laboratory. One of the NFL employees, Jerry Glenn, approached the management and requested to buy the ranch. He was sold to him and he operated the ranch for another few years before he was finally retiring and selling the operation. In the early 1970s, the majority of the 126,000 acre NFL property was sold to McCullough Properties. McCullough subdivided the property and sold parcels to private parties. Since solvents were used to clean tested engines, there was some swellage and contamination at test sites. In 1980, and again in 1989, the Environmental Protection Agency evaluated the uh, site under the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, CERCLA, to undertake an investigation on its own to ensure the welfare of residents and, uh, and the environment. In early 1991, Rock and I conducted an environmental survey which evaluated water quality in private wells within one half mile of area B, C, and D. In 1992, a similar survey was conducted within a half mile of area E. Results in 91 92 surveys indicated that private wells on three properties, one area B and two at area, area D, contained solvents. The primary solvent discovered was trichloroethylene, TCE. Immediately upon discovery of the solvents in the private wells, Rock and Dine notified the affected residents and Worcester County Health Department and supplied these, the residents with bottled water for drinking. Treatment systems were installed and supplied these uh, to remove the solvents from the wells. The wells were later removed from service. When this became public, other residents in the area became concerned. So Rockadine sampled solvents and private wells within a three-mile three radius of each of the test sites. 
over 170 private wells were tested. Currently, all wells uh, within the test area met drinking standards. As late as 2004, Dr. Dine was still committed to foreign environment uh, monitoring and groundwater cleanup systems and, and monitor their performance. In conjunction with county, state, Dr. Dine has been given community briefing since 1991. Progress reports are distributed to homeowners, associations, repositories, and regulatory agencies on a quarterly basis. All reports uh, and work plans prepared during this investigation are available for review at the main Washington County Library on Center Street in Reno or state and county environmental officers. While most of the contamination was cleaned out, there was still uh, one site where contamination leaked into the bedrock and basically cannot be, be removed. Only time will tell. And that is the end of the show. Any questions? Dick, that was very interesting. I, I'm just so much information and just um, those those photos were fascinating. I, you know, I've only heard a little bit, you know, in the last several years, but gosh, you know, those those images that you were able to um, get for this presentation and to kind of share the history, it's it's quite fascinating. Um, well, I do have a I do have some a, a couple of, um, questions that sure. I see. Um, uh, Oh, lady, uh, somebody um, logged in late. They wanted to ask, how did Dick decide what um, that Rockadine was his area of interest? They zoomed in late. Do you want to just um, maybe mention again well, how you got interested yeah. right, in this I topic? Was, I was manning the front desk at the museum. And a gentleman came in and said that he was getting ready to write a book. And he wanted to know what the Swartz Museum had about that test site. I did not know a test site even existed. <laughs> <coughs> so I went in the back and checked everything, and we had nothing on a test site at all. And I decided that couldn't happen. We had to find out what about it so we could research that. And that's when I went on, on a, a tear kind of to find out about it. I went online. I did find a, a couple of websites, and then I advertised them to wrote an article in the newspaper uh, asking for um, past employees to contact me. About uh, 15, 60 of them didn't contact me. Most of them were, were afraid to talk at all because they had been told it was classified. Well, yeah, most classification runs out in 30 years. They didn't care. They still were bum. But uh, I did find there's two of them that said they lived up in Idaho, and I went up and visited both of them. Alan Chambers is the one who provided all the photographs to me. And those are all currently on uh, in in the library here at the museum. Okay. Okay. Um, can do you know how um, did they get the propellants? Um, that was a question. The 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 chemicals that they were used in the liquid nitrogen and um, in some of the other materials. Do you know um, any of that? My have no clue. Okay. I would I would assume they, they where do you buy liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen? I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um because Rockadine was a secret, how did the, do you did they did the gentleman talk about how did were they able to get these large pieces or of equipment into the Reno Sparks area? It, I would think that part of them, you know, were in parts, they had to construct them. Um, but it's such a big piece of property and, you know, of the earlier time period, maybe people weren't paying attention since the interstate. Um, do you know any information? Did they talk no, about any of that? Not exactly, but I can tell you how other stuff has been handled uh, okay. when, when they were operating at uh, uh, Don South and testing for uh, various jet aircraft and so forth. They slap them on a flatbed behind a truck and throw a big old car, car over them and haul them down the road. 
You will see trucks going by all the time. Nobody worries what's underneath her tarp. That's true. And and uh, when I was living back in Fallon and they were um, taking um, things from the Hawthorne Depot, um, you know, they were they were moving bombs and, and other equipment. And yeah, and you can definitely tell sometimes if it's more military or not. So right. yeah, the tarps definitely <laughs> make it a little bit uh, less obvious. Right. Um, so there is another question. Um, what is the bottom of this map in relation to Spanish Springs Library? I'm not sure where the Spanish Springs Boulevard is. Oh, uh, it, it's off Pyramid Highway. Go north on Pyramid Highway and you'll find kind of a round building and that's the, the Spanish Springs Library. How far it's it's a ways past that. Um, how do you know, like several miles or, you know, well, everything's building up over time. So <laughs> gaps are it's going crazy out there. I live out there uh, on this particular last slide where you see down to the bottom. It says. Uh, what was it saying? Oh, area we D. Yeah. I live just to the left of that. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, that's only 10 miles from, from downtown. Oh, okay. So the library, say, the library probably is seven miles from, from uh, Victorian Avenue on Pyramid. Okay. Okay. So in relations, as, as everything keeps getting built up, it's the gaps are closing, I guess. So. They certainly are. <laughs> um, do you know... Uh, you had mentioned um, people did contact you, um, but you you know got a lot of your information and photos from the two gentlemen that were up in Idaho. Um, did any of do you know if any of the scientists or workers that worked there did they stay in Reno and Sparks um, for some of the people that you kind of initially talked to? Yeah, several of you had uh, Jim Gardner, the uh, the well I showed in, in that one on. Uh, with telephone, uh, Reno graduate, he lives here. And okay. uh, there was another manager that lives in, in this area. So there's probably, in, in 2009, when I was doing all, those, all this research, there was about uh, oh, eight or nine in Reno and Sparks area. Okay, oh, that's great. Um, and I have another question. Um, are there housing projects planned for this area B and E areas? Um, kind of looking at the map there, isn't that, is all of that fenced off area or is it now because, no. you know, they were, you said they were kind of selling off. Is that when, now all been kind of built no. up when around? Rocket Dine, or? When Rocket yeah. Dine got ready to move out, they sold all the property to McCullough uh, Properties. And so that whole area out there is full of houses. There's nothing fenced off except uh, the little areas around uh, sites uh, D and, and B. That's the only ones. Everything else is, is ranches and, and farm. You can go out and drive around out there anytime you want to. Okay, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. But you know, when we're looking at some of those earlier photos, it's just so much open space. You know, um, Neil, did you say you had a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to comment. During the mid '60s, I worked for a business machine outfit called Frieden, and they had the large rotary calculators, and they had a whole slug of them out there, in the uh, uh, the the walled off building that he showed in the presentation, uh, that was like the one out of Stead. That was high security and all to go in there. I had an escort and the whole business. And the same thing when I had to go a little further back, but in some of the outlaying things where they had to have something to do the calculations for whatever reason. But what I, I remember most about it is this was in the dead of winter when I had to go out to repair a machine and there was a foot to a foot and a half of snow on the ground. 
until I got to even close to that immediate area and there was no snow, period. So I always suspected that there was activity underground along with the, the uh, surface uh, uh, testing. That's fascinating. Um, so I do have some more questions. Uh, somebody wants to ask, what happened to the remaining tubes, parts of the, um, the you know, the equipment? You know, you, you mentioned that, you know, the land has then been sold off and there's only just a couple small sections that are fenced off. Did right. the gentleman talk about what they did to, I guess, break everything down um, after they were done with this project? Oh, he was not there when they disassembled everything. So he doesn't know what happened to the stuff. Okay. When did they officially stop? I th uh, Somebody was asking that. And... 1970. Okay. I can't tell you the exact dates because I don't know. Okay. No, no. That's great. Um, somebody mentioned Area A support was where the Save Mart's currently located. Um, and Actually, there's... It was slight, a... slightly north of that. Oh, okay. Uh, there okay. was a uh, World War II airport, really strange looking. It had a, uh, a short runway that ran north-south, and then it had two, uh, I don't know how you say it, but angled sections, one at the uh, top and one at the bottom. And it was used for testing uh, or training people in aerial photography photography. What's interesting is that is the site of the first 1964 and 1965 Reno Air Races. That's before they moved over to Stead. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Wow. Well, that's interesting. I don't think I knew that. Sherry, could I make one more comment? Oh, absolutely, sir. We have a full section of photographs that my dad took inside and out, plus aerials of Sky Ranch, and they are at the Historical Society. Oh, you're right. We do. Yeah. Under, in your photo collection. Yeah, Sky Ranch. Yeah, we do. Um, oh, let's see. There's a... Um, oh, uh, Lorraine was asking, Dick, did you ever find any newspaper articles about the activity at Rocket at Rocketdyne, like you know, at, during after the fact or or anything since it was top secret? I, you know, I that's one thing I did not search for. Uh, I in in a lot of the articles I write for the uh, the headlight news newsletter for the museum, I do a lot of research online. Uh, and, and newspaper articles, but uh, I didn't on this 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 project. Well, and part of the follow up um, was mentioning that uh, with her dad, um, parts of the engines came through our house after arriving at the airport in the middle of the night when my father was responsible for picking them up at the Reno International Airport. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's very exciting. So why why do we have a Reno International Airport? Do you know that? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, very exciting. This is great. I learned definitely um, um, a lot about this this kind of hidden program. But I really um, I feel like I learned a lot. And just I I thought it was interesting. The one. Um, the night photo that was like test 23 that yes. was quite fascinating how it, with the glow um, oh, at yeah. night and just the the um the temperatures you were mentioning about 5000 6000 degrees fahrenheit you know with the burn off of the hydrogen oxygen and um you can see that they were being very efficient and you know documenting all aspects and um, oh, yeah. did did they ever mention anything about uh accidents i mean you know as they're you know figuring um different tests out you know like you were saying like the condor and then the gemini i was just kind of curious if the, the guy the two men you were talking with i'm sure there were, there were injuries out there on, on various things but i i don't know of any uh okay i, I certainly can't document anything okay 
Well, yeah, that's that's the that's the hard part. And if it really wasn't, you know, if it's not in the paper, not really documented, it's kind of hard to track all of that. But you never know. Um, I'm wondering at some point the public information acts, you know, will they release information on some of these projects, you know, from the government sure, as well? I'm sure if we ever had any fatalities out there, we didn't know about it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. regular accident is no. Somebody falls and breaks a leg or something, nobody says anything. Okay. okay. Except the guy in his family. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this was wonderful, Dick. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I don't see any other questions, but this was quite fascinating. And um, and if anybody has any questions, they definitely can get in touch with you in the Sparks Heritage Museum. Because um, I remember uh, many years ago, didn't you guys have kind of a uh, an exhibit or um, at the yes. museum? Yes, we did an exhibit about uh, going to the moon and so forth. Okay. Uh, one of our uh, board members, uh, Dr. Richard Simmons, actually worked for NASA uh, for a long time, and he designed, uh, he calls it a mouse house, and it was put mice in and fly them in this, out to the, uh, the moon and back, and then examine them afterwards to see what cosmic rays did to their brain, so they knew what astronauts uh, had to worry about. So you know, things like that, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's that's quite amazing. And the reality is that they did test with animals and dogs and monkeys yep. before they started sending men to to travel around the earth and then going to the moon. So well, this was fascinating. Thank you so much. And, and yeah. thank you, Neil, for asking Dick to give us this great program. And, and as always, thank you, everybody, for attending our program today. And, and thank you, Washoe County um, Library System, for always helping us out. So without any further uh, comments, let me send it back to Teresa. So. Hello. Well, as I've said before, Nevada is the coolest state. <laughs> And I love this program. It's such an honor to have hosted again. Thank you all for joining us. And a heartfelt thanks to Sherry Hazorn with the Nevada Historical Society. Historian, well, everyone here is a historian, right? <laughs> and, and John, our library system tech wizard for making this event possible. And don't forget to sign up for the next High Noon with Neil Cobb presented on Thursday, March 16th. To register, please visit washoecountylibrary.us slash events and have a great day. Mm -hmm.